So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening uh, to everybody. Welcome to this edition of Our Stars webinars. I'm Tony Schönenberger. I'm the co-founder and executive chairman of uh, Stars. I have the great pleasure, by the way, to also welcome Uli Zick as one of our participants at this uh, session. Today, we have the uh, great privilege uh, to talk to Michael Schindler. Michael, it's really great to have you on this webinar. Thank you very much for joining the session. Well, Mich Thank you. Michael is, um, I would say, pretty much unique. Everyone is born, unique. He was born in the former GDR, studying uh, quantum physics in the Soviet Union, being director of the theater in Basel, being founding a general director of the Berlin Opera Foundation. He is or was a cultural advisor in Dubai, in Moscow, in Hong Kong, in Saudi Arabia. And generally speaking, he's a writer, he's a filmmaker, he's a curator, etc. And last but not least, he's a member of the STARS International Board. We have now approximately 30 minutes uh, to discuss with uh, Michael. Uh, I will take the privilege to ask the first couple of questions. If you have any questions for Michael, please use the, key, the Q and A feature below to type in your question. So let's go right into a media's race. Uh, Michael, looking at your biography, and I mentioned uh, a few points at least, I should also mention one other thing, that you studied uh, quantum physics together with Angela Merkel to become the federal chancellor of uh, Germany later on. Both of you actually moved from science to the world of politics, the world of culture, the world of art, respectively. What was then actually the reason to do, to move from A to B? This is uh, quite unusual. Um, thank you for putting this question, Tony, and in general, inviting me here to this session. Uh, I'm otherwise um, often visiting your webinars and find them uh, very insightful and interesting. I uh, hope we can live up to this uh, standard today, too. Um, first of all, uh, I have to uh, slightly correct you. I didn't study with uh, Angela Merkel. We, uh, sh she studied in the, in, GD, in, the, in the East Germany. I studied in the Soviet Union. And she's also slightly older than me. She, we wouldn't have studied together. Uh, but um, my first um, and only position as a scientist and researcher was at the Academy of Sciences in East Berlin. Uh, and we were sharing one office, the two of us together. We were uh, in one office. She was already a few years ahead uh, as a researcher and was about to uh, make her PhD, um, whereas I was still in the beginning. So uh, I just uh, was a freshman uh, coming back from the Soviet Union after five years. It was middle of the uh, 1980s. Uh, the time when uh, in Germany, in East Germany, things become, became already wobbly uh, and it was uh, kind of the last and uh, maybe fatal phase uh, of the system. So that overshadowed also kind of uh, our work at that time uh, in Berlin. Um, and yeah, mentioning this, um, of course, uh, the fall of the wall uh, was the main disruptive moment in our biographies and Merkel and myself, we both come from a generation uh, which was mostly shaped by Cold War and an iron curtain dividing also the country and the city of Berlin. Uh, and in many ways, um, the, the moment when the wall fell and this iron curtain was lifted, we were still young enough um, to reconsider our life in general. We were in our 20s or 30s. Uh, so on the one hand, aware of that this is a major change and challenge uh, in all respects. And on the other hand, uh, it is a great opportunity. And we took this opportunity. We understood that uh, most likely um, the things we have done so far won't matter in the future that much anymore. Uh, we need to kind of reinvent ourselves. And that's what we did. Right. There's actually an interesting, maybe I can just uh, tell you one thing in this uh, context, because it mattered for my life and to some extent, obviously, also for Merkel. Um, 
when I um, left the, the Academy of Sciences in uh, the late 1980s, uh, I gave Merkel a book um, and I made a kind of uh, dedication uh, in the book uh, to her, which was uh, go into the wide open. And uh, that became Merkel's motto, obviously, in her political work later. She has mentioned this many times and addressed this even in a national speech uh, in uh, the first year when she, as a chancellor in 2006, referring to our friendship, that showed that uh, even over uh, 15 years, uh, it was still uh, alive as a, as a very important uh, um, kind, of, kind of motto. And I think go into the wide open uh, was a motto for many East Germans and Eastern Europeans uh, after uh, this um, uh, kind of political change had happened. And uh, it shaped most of our uh, uh, also professional biographies. This sounds like that you are planning a film on Angela Merkel. Does it sound like that? Yes, it no, does. Uh, I have to say, uh, <clears throat> first of all, um, I would never make a film about someone I know uh, that well without uh, talking to that person also in person. And indeed, we talked about Angela and I talked about uh, this possibility uh, several times over the last years, and I was never keen to do this as long as she was a chancellor. Um, maybe one day in the future, this is going to happen. But again, I would only do it if she's uh, getting involved, because I was actually uh, asked by many filmmakers over the last years who made films about Merkel. And usually she was not present in the film. And I don't think that this is the way how I would approach it. In any case, we are looking forward to having Angela Merkel on the, one of our star symposium, be it in Shenzhen, Singapore, or in Switzerland, one day. OK, uh, Michael, next question. Uh, I introduced you as a person of uh, art and as a person of culture. Uh, generally speaking, and uh, this was also a, always a question I, I ask myself, what could managers learn from culture, from art? Well, uh, it's a bit of a tricky question uh, at this moment where uh, culture is in a kind of defensive mode um, because it is particularly hit by the crisis uh, of the pandemic. I think... Um, I have to admit, uh, I was always a critic uh, over the last 10, 15 years uh, about the mental state uh, of uh, cultural workers and the cultural landscape in general, uh, because I felt they more and more remained in a kind of splendid isolation from the rest of the society, felt that they are representing both at the same time tradition and innovation. And uh, it didn't really play out this way, as we can see now during the pandemic, where um, cultural institutions were regarded as not as relevant as many others were. So in other words, uh, I think uh, the cultural sector is in a kind of uh, defensive mode and needs to reconsider their role in the society and what, what, kind, what kind of tasks they have. You know, if you look at cities in Europe in particular, but also in North, Amer North America or even in, in other parts of the world, cultural institutions often are located in the center. And that gives you the impression that they are really at the heart of the society. But I'm not sure if that is really uh, true uh, yet. And I think we have to regain and rewin also uh, the interest and uh, the relevance uh, we uh, enjoy to have. However, having said that, I have to admit that uh, I do think that uh, in particular, uh, the business world, and maybe our life in general today, is extremely driven by optimization, by efficiency, or let it bluntly uh, by numbers, by figures. And I do think that um, in the future, maybe already in the present, it shows that this kind of uh, lifestyle um, is maybe not really appropriate uh, to uh, meet the challenges of our time. I do think that figures are extremely important. As you said already, I'm a scientist. At the same time, I, I'm someone who really believes that the only resource on the planet which is inexhaustible is the human resource. And the human resource uh, is composed not only of uh, the logic part, uh, but also of an emotional part, of a social part. And I think leadership uh, requires much more understanding of the social uh, and the emotional part. 
uh, if we want to cope with the challenges to come. We can see this already currently. People, on the one hand, understand that it was necessary to go to all these uh, lockdowns and restrictions, which are kind of uh, processes of optimization. But at some time, at some point, people get exhausted of it, and they need to find other need. To, they want other answers from the leadership, and that's why I think uh, this is one of the lessons to learn from the from the pandemic too. But you would go that far to say that culturally minded managers and executives are better managers. Well, that's maybe a, a, a little bit uh, sounds like an advert uh, to me, uh, but I think um, in. If you speak about the role of uh, at least culture in its holistic understanding, that is not only art, but that is sports, that is media, that is maybe even science and research, then indeed, I think uh, we need to have a leadership which uh, encompasses these uh, different knowledges because our world has become uh, that complex. And I do think that uh, a strict um, doctrine of uh, the uh, concept of optimization is problematic. Turning to the film, why do you have such a strong focus or a major focus on film, particularly recently? Well, um, I think it takes some time, or it took for me at least some, as you know, I, I, I had to uh, a, a longer trajectory to go uh, to, to get there maybe also. Uh, I, I did many other things before, I was running theaters uh, and uh, I'm still involved in, in many cultural efforts. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer, but in the first, um, um, uh, I think uh, first and foremost, I'm a storyteller. And um, filmmaking is, of course, a very complex form of storytelling, allowing, therefore, also a much more uh, uh, diversified uh, uh, development. And I'm uh, a documentary filmmaker in the first place, which means even if we use sometimes fiction, our interest is the reality. And the reality is not a one-to-one -one, uh, thing, you know? It's not, if you, uh, the reality is not to everyone the same. It's not uh, the same even for yourself all the time, as you know, yourself from by experience. So in other words, um, as a documentary maker, filmmaker, what matters most is that you find the right perspective, uh, to, the right angle to look at this reality, uh, to, to discover something in this reality. You're always on a hunt for the moment of authenticity. Uh, and at the same time, uh, film is, of course, you know, it is the picture, it is uh, intellectual or uh, kind of uh, social exchange and content. It is music. Uh, so it has a great complexity to share stories with other people. And uh, that is what I like most, that you have this, uh, you know, these many tools uh, to, to do this. And uh, you go out in the field uh, not knowing what's going to happen very often. It's really like in a hunting uh, exercise. And uh, you're not alone. You're with a team. And that is also an interesting experience. As a writer, you're sitting and, and have to create almost everything on your own. And here uh, in film, you enjoy actually uh, the views of others. And uh, that helps also to create a more complex uh, product. In your films, there is now a major focus again on China. Um, it's the bird's nest on the Olympic Stadium in uh, Beijing. It's the Chinese life so fully sick. It's the new film will be M plus uh, the sick collection. Now, the question is, uh, what are the major or were the major challenges for you as a filmmaker? And what was the major result, actually, of these uh, three films? Well, um, maybe, as you mentioned already, uh, I should probably say again that uh, I studied in the Soviet Union uh, in the late 70s and uh, 80s, and, uh, in the early 1980s, um, at a very different time, very different from today. Uh, but what, what was uh, quite, and I worked actually in the Soviet Union in the in the late Perestroika era again that, at that time already as a, as a journalist for the German speaking newspaper in Russia, in Moscow, and uh, you could see that China takes a very different uh, um, direction, uh, coming out of this kind of communist uh, uh, world system. 
And I was very keen to see after the doom of uh, communism, uh, which I have to admit was very happy. I was personally very happy about this uh, for myself. At the same time, I was wondering, of course, what's going to happen in China. So I already started uh, investigating or following it, observing this uh, during the 90s. And um, you mentioned that I became the director of um, the theater in Basel. That was in the mid 90s of the last century. And uh, I befriended very soon with a couple of architects, um, Herzog and Dömeron, who are actually world stars and were about to enter this kind of stage of global architecture, star architecture uh, at that time by designing the modern Tate Modern in, in London. Uh, so we were uh, very close at that time in particular, because Basel is also a small place, so you really uh, find each other easily, and it was uh, a great time. And um, I told them, when you really do something in China, I would like to follow this, uh, and that would be my first big project uh, as a filmmaker, and it happened uh, by luck, you could say also, and thanks to Uli Siku, who's present today, as you said already, who obviously helped out to make the connection also between the architects and uh, the Chinese uh, government at that time. Um, for me, it was not an exercise to study architecture. For me, it was about learning through um, the building and the development of that stadium about how the Chinese uh, society, in particular the government, tries to explain to themselves and the world what is China going to be in this century. Uh, as so many times before, the Olympics have been used as a platform to speak to the world about who we are and what we want to be in the world. And I was keen to understand this. And uh, we took actually um, a lot of time. We were there more than 20 times over five years uh, to follow um, this process from the groundbreaking ceremony uh, to the opening. And uh, that became at the same time a social document. Uh, even more so because um, the, as you know, intermediary between uh, Herzog and Dömerung and the government was Ai Weiwei, the artist, who at that time um, was rather not that long yet back to China and uh, had in the beginning also a slightly more optimistic look at what's going on in the country and what kind of contribution he could make to that. That changed over the following years. And in the film, we actually show that kind of change of mind of uh, Ai Weiwei as well. So because many of the things around him happened, uh, for example, the shutdown of his block in the 2000, around 2007 at, at that time. Why China? Uh, I thought already in the 90s that China is going to become a, a very uh, interesting and, and important country. And I wanted to already always, uh, I wanted to understand better China because I felt very intrigued by um, uh, their culture, their history, uh, their humanity. Uh, and I want to get in touch with this. But I have to say, um, it was only six collection of contemporary Chinese art, which is in, its, um, in a certain way unique, uh, which gave me the impression that this is the angle. I talked before about the documentary filmmaker who needs to always find his angle to look at things to shape something very complex and to share a story which uh, you know, is significant. When I saw the, the, the collection of Uli Sig for the first time, I understood that contemporary Chinese art is in itself actually a document, a social document about the change and the transformation of the Chinese society since the end of the Mao time. And I felt using this as my angle to, sh to tell the story about China uh, and uh, go over uh, a long period, uh, that would be great. And uh, you mentioned already that we are about to make a third uh, installment. So in all together would be a trilogy of films um, sort of showing how uh, architecture, but even more so contemporary art, reflect the transformation of the, um, the Chinese society over a span of 20 years, because we started in the early 2000s, uh, representing always the same protagonists, Sersung Dömerong, Ai Wei, Uli Sik, and a few others. Um, because also the new film will include them. Herzog and Deverum have designed the museum in Hong Kong and Uli Sieg donated the collection. Well, the uh, latest uh, project of the N Plus um, uh, Sieg collection, and we were talking about it before the, the webinar, you are confronting, uh, you are confronted by major challenges right now in Hong Kong. When can we uh, expect to see the film and what are the challenges for you as a filmmaker regarding 
is the M plus uh, uh, seed collection film. Well, as we know, um, Hong Kong was was already earlier a troubled place, uh, socially troubled place. I was uh, in Hong Kong since uh, 2008, nine regularly. I was at that time an advisor consultant to the West Kowloon Culture Dis uh, District Authority, uh, which is the uh, authority developing the whole cultural uh, landscape in at Victoria Harbor, which includes uh, the Museum of M Plus, uh, and uh, during the years, I saw, of course, that there were major tensions because uh, people were often really um, unafraid to speak out uh, about uh, the, the uh, uh, delays in their process of uh, democratization. They were offered a promise uh, to experience and to enjoy. And you remember the umbrella movement and, and other precursors to what happened then in 2019, where the riots uh, uh, reached a point where things uh, obviously for the Chinese government became uh, more uh, tricky. So now we have a law in, in China, uh, in, in Hong Kong, which imposes uh, a lot of regulations and then don't make it as easy anymore as it was used to be uh, to speak out and uh, to enjoy freedom of expression and also freedom of art. And therefore, of course, um, we have to see how we can cope with this. On the one hand, of course, we want to show this, but on the other hand, I still think that the museum and uh, the organization uh, represent um, a, a very bold move of the city of Hong Kong to position themselves uh, as a global place and hub for creativity and also for representing Chineseness uh, in a very particular way. And uh, I always loved Hong Kong uh, for many reasons. Uh, many of our participants probably will understand. And that's why I have a lot of sympathy for this. I have to say also an East German and a former Berliner. For me, Hong Kong was always a little bit like West Berlin uh, because uh, in the Cold War times, you know, you, you actually received all uh, the stuff of the West through one uh, single gate and that was West Berlin. That was the showcase of the West in East Germany. And Hong Kong in some way played a similar role in China over a very long time. I would also slightly touch another film your latest uh, project, actually, the film on the uh, two biotech uh, founders. Why did you do this film, first of all, and what are your lessons learned? Well, first of all, I have to give the credits to Hans Hingartner, who may actually be here present today, too, uh, one of our uh, dear board members. Um, without him uh, being so close to them and a mentor to them, I wouldn't have uh, been able uh, to make that film. And only because I knew of this connection, uh, I, this came to my mind because I imagined that these guys don't really have time for someone like myself who drags them out of the laboratory or their research uh, uh, work and uh, tries to share the story. At the same time, I think um, it is an extraordinary story. There's no question that uh, they are, for me, representing um, a new type of a scientist to some extent also. Uh, something I have to admit too, as a German, uh, I'm Swiss, but I'm German too. And I have to say, as a German, I'm pretty proud of these people because, as you know, they're coming from Turkey and that shows something about the German society uh, that it was possible that these people made this kind of career. Uh, and also were supported by investors and uh, governmental ins institutions that they could make the research. In the end of the day, it is a great uh, story about luck and about genius. And that's always something which attracts me. And I think um, they uh, have achieved a long lasting uh, heritage, a legacy. And um, I'm, I could actually make a second installment already because they are now about to make this uh, adapted vaccine, which is again, a very important thing. So they are in the second kind of project Lightspeed uh, involved uh, currently. Uh, and at the same time, I have to say, for me, it was a major message uh, beyond science that sometimes the disruptive innovation doesn't come from the center of a industry but it may come from the periphery. It may come from people who are doing some things out there and nobody knew about it. And suddenly it becomes important for everyone. And that was actually a very great lesson uh, for, of the film. You 
You also had been, and you still are, a cultural advisor in many different locations, actually. I, I mentioned Dubai, Moscow, Saudi Arabia, etc. Now, the question would be, um, did you want actually to use culture or your job at that time as a cultural advisor as a tool to bring along some change, some changes in these uh, rather autocratic societies? Well, I'm working also, uh, by the way, in Berlin or in, in Switzerland. So um, it's not that I'm exclusively in um, those countries. However, yes, I'm also currently working again uh, very intensely in Saudi Arabia because many things are happening there. And I think uh, it matters to be present in this. You always have as an individual, as, as well as, as an institution, you have to make choices and you have to uh, always evaluate if this is a place to go and if you feel safe also politically uh, or not to go there. I felt safe to go to Saudi Arabia a few years ago. Uh, I'm not there as an executive, uh, but I'm uh, advising the government on the cultural development of their most important uh, project, which actually now they announced uh, the Ministry of Culture just this week announced that they want to become the cultural center of the whole Middle East. Um, and I'm not sure if this is going to happen, but what I can see is there's an enormous transformation in many of these developing countries. And often governments uh, with a more kind of um, open-minded uh, uh, concept understand that culture is a tool for creating a new uh, social or societal openness. Culture is maybe even an incubator uh, for testing social changes and transformations. And I think uh, that is something great. And um, I have to say, if the Western world has something to offer uh, to other countries, then it is exactly this, because we made the same experience in our societies maybe 100 to 200 years ago. Enlightenment started with the development of culture and arts. And that's why I do think that um, we as Western uh, art workers or cultural workers and cultural experts uh, should actually take the, the opportunity to get involved in this, to shape it in a way that the uh, experiences of our culture sort of remain and uh, become also a kind of part of, of, this, uh, of, this, of these new projects. We are running out of time. Maybe the last uh, more personal question, uh, Michael, listening to you, I think we all got the impression that you are a very, let's call it ambitious person. What is your final ambition, professionally speaking? What is your major message? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I, I really believe, uh, uh, I'm a very optimistic person, I have to admit, uh, despite many setbacks in my life. And if you do many different things, you have to always cope challenges. Uh, I'm a very optimistic person, and I, as I said in the beginning, really believe in the human resource. I'm very keen to always study uh, what the human resource can achieve, and I do think that um, we, um, I'm, I'm, I'm now 61, and I don't know how long I'm going to last, but uh, I'm, I think I'm, I'm not uh, finished in discovering and exploring and observing this uh, uh, human resource and its capacity. Now, a very, very final question, Michael, from uh, Jens Osterberg, just coming in. Uh, I just read it. Which culture channel could serve us in embracing Russia or root a peaceful and thriving relationship going forward? Which cultural channel? Which culture channel could serve us in embracing Russia? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I do think there are many cultural channels. There is an enormous exchange between Russia and the Western world, and in the cultural sphere, it never really was interrupted. Um, I do think that if for, if for Russia applies uh, the same story like for anyone else, an on-par relationship, that's what matters. 
And the good thing is in culture, nobody would dispute the importance of the Russian culture. They had some of the greatest writers, filmmakers, artists whatsoever. That's why it is an on par relationship. That's why maybe uh, the cultural sector is in this way or in this uh, sense also, maybe a, a blueprint for how to move forward also in other sectors. We need to look at these other nations, other countries and other systems in a more on uh, par uh, perspective. And a very final question, Michael, if you allow. Where do you get your inspiration from? That's very different. Uh, sometimes, as I said, um, for example, the BioNTech film wouldn't have happened without uh, um, Hans Heengartner, um, to some extent, uh, without the, uh, having met uh, the architects in Basel, uh, may have not even have started this trilogy about uh, China. Um, on the one hand, it's personal contacts. It's people who actually give me in the conversation new ideas and thoughts. It is sometimes something uh, I read. Uh, I'm, I'm reading extremely uh, unsystematic, I have to, I have to admit because I'm always uh, out there for um, my, I have my own kind of uh, system of uh, what I find significant. Finally, I, I think what is very important is the possibility of making joints, uh, the, uh, connecting the dots in your own way. And if you learn a lot of things over time, uh, there are many dots and many ways uh, to connect uh, things. And that is always the most uh, interesting part, how to connect the dots in a way that it falls into place for yourself. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Time is up, unfortunately. We have to come to an end. First, um, thank you very much again for uh, your brilliant insights. I think we all learned an awful lot from you, from your insights, culturally speaking, but also as managers and uh, business people. I wish you all the best and every success for your next project. We are very much looking forward to your next film be it M plus C collection or be it another film. So again, thank you very much, Michael. Secondly, the next webinar will be in two weeks from now with uh, STARS alumnus uh, John Dino from Singapore. He will speak on reinventing aquaculture into vertical oceans. So it will be on sustainability and food, particularly seafood. I hope to see you there. Thank you very much again. All the best, take care and goodbye.